do 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 that's the angle do do what do do that's the podcast dude yeah man it's it's funny they have a music like a like a dj come in and dj here like yeah. last night every tuesday okay and so usually this is like what's kind of just like left over nice the wine i just come and drink it the next Fuck day you're fucking right right i'm yeah. not complaining dude like i've been drinking a lot more wine lately than like hard liquor have you yeah and it's been like because I don't know when I when I used to work in a restaurant like we used to have to have like wine tastings and mm-hmm. stuff and I always got like headaches off of them and then so I really like stayed away from it but then recently I started drinking like more red wine mm-hmm. and that shit's been like perfect I've been in the zone like painting and shit like and I don't get too fucked up you know no I feel you like wine's like a slower it's, it's, like, a, a, it's, like, a, it's like a slow it's creeper. a different like yeah it's like it creeps up on you and then it's more like a like a I really buzz more like versus just being like. Ugh. You know that's a saying? good way to put it like it's a different buzz like yeah. when i drink wine during an interview for sure i feel like more connected and emotional yeah, weird way. Like, i'm more like ooh, like dialed in this and, is what people would drink over a good dinner you know what i'm saying like, yeah they say a glass of wine a day is good for you so fuck it <laughs> <laughs> hey well cheers man i don't know if we did that already cheers. but yes sir i'm taking a sippy but sean man it's it or sp the plug uh, I'm gonna call you Sean because yeah, <laughs> that's for right now. But uh, dude, it's been two years dude. since I've since we've last seen each other's, seen each other's face, and he's yeah. started enunciating my words here. Jesus, I can't believe that. <laughs> I went back and I looked at the photos today because I I was gonna try and print some out, uh-huh. but uh, my printer was just looking like the colors were so weird. So I was like, I don't want to give him shitty printed right, photos. Right, right. <laughs> but it was so crazy. I was like, dang, two years ago, I was like Sean was killing the game two years ago. Uh, like, and the time has flown by, it all. hasn't like, it? Yes, bro. Like when you said two years, I'm like, I guess I had to think for a second. Like, yeah, it has been almost two years. It's crazy. It's huh? the last time, yeah. And it feels like it was just like yesterday we was fucking around, you know? Did, well, I mean, that that was was that your first exhibition? That was my first solo uh exhibit. Oh, okay. So like and then that was the first time I exhibited work over the course of like uh I think we were in there for like a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time I had work like standing in one spot versus it just being like one or two night event pop up, you know, style. I feel you. And so that was exciting for me. And then like um you know how we how we started it with the with the whole first night with the interview with That was Molly. so good. And it was like so like intimate and everybody who was there was showing love and it was just like a dope way to pop it off. Like that was the first time I was like, Okay, like this is what I this is what I'm definitely like thought it was gonna be like. You know what I'm saying? Dude, it was so cool and just the feeling of how because the gallery was downstairs and we were upstairs. Right. How we all sat around, you're on the couch, and you guys did like a little interview. Mm-hmm. It was really nice how they built that com- emotional connection first with yeah. you, and then you went and saw and the pieces. And then you went and seen the work, yeah. So it was like building up anticipation, and then now we all get to see it for the first time. Yeah. So that was dope. Like I like I liked the, uh, that whole setup for real. I, I, was, I was inspired by that. A lot of my recent art shows, I, I used that format. Yeah. I did a show good. at Shopkeepers, and we did this exact same thing. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. It's, it's magic in that. Like, I don't, I got to give, you know, Molly the credit. She set all that up. And I was just like, yo, she's like, you just worry about the art. <laughs> yeah. And I'll take care of everything. I'm like, bet. <laughs> like, all right. That sounds yeah. great. That That's so at what point of your career were you at that point? Like, where would you say you were? So I'm like, I'm over five years in, like closer to six than five years in. Mm-hmm. And so that was almost two years ago. So I was, I was, you know, I had gotten my feet wet by that point. I had built up, a, you know, a pretty nice amount of like originals that I wanted to show. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I think that's when I really started just find myself as an artist, kind of like figuring out like the type of things I want to do, uh, how I want to monetize like what I'm doing. And, and I knew I had to have a solo show. Like that's just like a, you know, cross off the the artist bucket list, if you will, like everybody wants to have their own like yeah, solo you show. You need to, you need yeah, to. Yeah, like I love collaborating with other people and everything. Um, but it's also important, you know, to showcase like you're just yourself because it can get. I've been at art shows where there's like, you know, there's a hundred artists under one roof, mm-hmm. and people can get kind of overwhelmed because they, they, you know, there's so much going on, so much visual stimulation, and then it's hard to just focus on that one creative's, you know, output. Yeah. And so like I th- I think that's important for uh, artists to at least in some capacity have like a solo ex- exhibit, and then you know of course you're gonna do group shows and things of that nature, but you definitely want to like get everybody in the room that's just like talking about what you're doing. Well, yeah, in a lot of ways, like the solo exhibit, it feels like a coming of as an artist. Like, like yeah, if you have enough. It's like of- you dropping your first album or yeah. your mixtape. You know, like. You don't have like J. Cole, no features. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> <laughs> you just drop that shit, and then it's like 
you know everything like it's 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 almost like a you know your a litmus test so you can kind of see how people engage react to your work because if you're with other if you're with other artists they might be engaging or something with another piece that can be mer- misinterpreted as like a connection with yours you know yeah and so you yeah, want to make you're getting it all like real reads you know what i mean and that's that's also important too because as artists we're all sensitive about our shit yeah and so it's good to get like a uh, an objective view of like how people objectively view your stuff you know what i mean what was some of the were you getting a lot of feedback from that event like do you remember yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean granted we we had some whiskey tastings that oh, night yeah it <laughs> was like some whiskey sponsor at night oh yeah, yeah yeah i mean but not nah, I, like, I, went, I went home with like a two like two or three bottles of whiskey from the whiskey rep that day yeah bro like they had <laughs> bottles for, yeah. i was like yo whoever this rep is i need their number yeah but uh nah that night it was all love like i just remember like all like you know just positive it was a lot of people that knew me already uh-huh. and so a lot of people related to my journey in different ways depending on what season that we were you know in each other's lives but um no nah, it was dope dog like i got all like love that night and um you know continuing on from that point people were still coming back and like picking up you know artist prints mm-hmm. and stuff like that so that was cool and then the owners were, were so cool too yeah seda and yeah. all of them. yeah they're super cool i'm yeah. still in touch with all that yeah yeah they're good people dang so i mean oh my god so much has has happened for you then but at that time were you were you a full-time artist at that point too yeah yeah i was full-time at that time okay at that time, yep yeah, I mean, I think that's an important distinction because it's like if you've been doing it for five or six years, it's like you're you're seriously doing something right. Yeah, so like I I transitioned full time like a little after the two year mark. Mm-hmm. So like it was that those first couple of years where I was working full time and like painting whenever I could, but I knew like I wanted to be able to paint. Like that was my dream, just be able to like wake up and paint. You know what I mean? Isn't that a weird feeling working a job for someone else, but but you know what you were like what you really want to do? Well, I, for me, it gave me, like, a sense of um, just, like, I wouldn't get too, like, high or low because, mm-hmm. like, you know, when you're working in the restaurant industry, it, it's pretty, like, a high stress atmosphere, especially if you're in a busier restaurant. You got to deal with the kitchen. You got to deal with the guests. You got to oh, deal yeah. with your managers and everything's moving. And it's, like, every night's different. Mm-hmm. So one night could be smooth as hell. And then the next day you come in and it's, like you know world war three dude i know exactly <clears throat> i've worked it for many years as well so I, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about and so like that would give me my peace in the back of my head like you know what eventually i won't have to do this shit anymore you know like <laughs> i'm working on something to get me out of here versus like oh my god i'm stuck here for how long i don't know you know what i mean dude, I, like, I remember being a waiter living in norfolk going to school being like god like I, there's no way i could do this rest of my life yeah like, i know what i think everybody should at some point do it but it Amen. should only be it should only be for like you know temporary because like you need to be on the other side so that you know how to act when you go sit down somewhere because <laughs> some people have no etiquette at all. Bro, that, that is real. And talk it's right like there. you know they just they they think they're being totally fine and it's like on the other side you're like yo this this dude right here is the worst you know what I'm saying <laughs> like I've had some nightmares before too but you know like that's that was that was my piece though like and I, that would be my woo side be like you know what eventually I won't have to come in here no more. And just knowing that, like, knowing I was on the path to leaving that situation, like, made me feel better. Yeah, I mean, dude, I, I 100% agree with you on that. Like, everyone at some point should do it, some sort of customer service, whether it's, like, mm-hmm. cashier mm-hmm. or working in a restaurant. Because you, you, you get a level of or, appreciation. Or, yeah, of like, appreciation for people and people who do all these jobs that you might see below you or whatever it is. Like, yeah. And it, and it, it humbles it, you. It does, Yeah, dude. it humbles you, like, man. That like, feeling of getting yelled at by, not yelled at, but, like, getting, like, having an upset customer and then taking that bad dish back to the kitchen and, and then now the, the chef, chef is oh, looking yeah. at you with those death stare eyes like and then you're like it and you know hour. at some point you know if if we messed up because you know and through the course of a night you, you could hit the wrong button or whatever if, yeah. you know you're gonna you're gonna have mistakes that's just with anything they would be like yo if you bring up the wrong food you gotta pay for it. it's coming out of your tips yeah, people are crazy so now it's like, like yeah so now it's like damn, you're you're losing money yeah. like there's been some nights like if you if you get like a couple bad tips and plus you mess up a couple of times like you might just walk out even <laughs> after working a whole shift it's like bro i can't not nah. this can't be me <laughs> and then there's wild. like a there's a cap there's a ceiling like they always try to sell you oh there's no ceiling you can make as many tips as you know as you can where were you which working? is true i was i was at a few different spots i okay. was at i was in chinatown mostly but i was at this spot called oya which is closed now but it was real dope like looked like miami vice on the inside all white Ooh. and then um I had one other uh, job uh, at an Italian, Italian restaurant Anymore. in DuPont. Yeah, at DuPont. And um, they were like super old school and 
And uh, it was just like, ah, it was too rigid for me. You know, you got to wear suspenders and a yeah. bow tie. I'm like, dog. <laughs> Have your apron creased and stuff like that. I'm like, I, 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 Jesus. I learned everything I knew about wine from an Italian restaurant. But it's yeah. like, in a lot of ways, in like in a lot of weird ways, like it, it taught you about business. It does. It does. And that's what that's what I was going to say. Like, there's there's like hidden like lessons yeah. in all the all the like all the crazy stuff that I've done in my life. I'm like, I look back now, and you know, as you get older, you start to have like a you know. In hindsight, it's always twenty twenty. So you look back, and you're like, "Oh, th- that's why that happened," you know. Yeah, okay. But in the moment, it's like, "Yo, what's going on?" But now, when I look back, I'm like, "Yo, I learned how to how to deal with strangers." Yep. Like every table that I approached was basically strangers. Mm-hmm. So you gotta, you know, you gotta be comfortable talking to strangers. You gotta be able to articulate whatever you're selling. Um, you know, you have to be, uh, you have to follow up. So if you, you know, if you lose sight of one of your tables, now they, they think you're ignoring them. Yeah, Same thing with customers. You're following up with following your leads up and stuff emails, like that. Yeah. leads, uh, you know, even if that means, you know, taking, the, you know, paying the Uber out of pocket and then going and setting up the meeting in person, just establishing that relationship. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing I learned. Relationships, especially in the art business are what like, what helps you get to the next level and keep 100%, progressing. 100% dude. Because... If I only knew, if I still only knew just a group of friends that I went to school with or high school with, I would be like stuck. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I have to get out. I have to talk to people. I have to meet people. I have to engage with people. That way they feel like they they, they have some type of, uh, you know, connection to my work. And a lot of times, you know, a lot of the things that I've come up on or the projects I've been given or opportunities to do have just been built on just having a steady a uh, relationship with somebody, whether it's like, hey, you know, how's it going? I was just checking in on you. I'm coming so and so. I'll be in your town next week. Little stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, oh, well, yeah, he remember me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or I remember him. Yeah. You know, and it's just like something can happen just like off that. Like I, my favorite event that I go to every year is South uh-huh. by South by Southwest. Okay. That whole like four or five days I'm down there before the music music mm. festival starts. Yeah. It's all networking and everybody is there to network. Ah. So you just go up and start talking to people and they expect that versus like being like out in DC, you know, people can be a little standoffish or yeah. just like so locked in. They don't, you know, and out there it's just like people, everybody's there just for that reason. People are there to meet you. Yes. To find and out so how we like, can help each other. Yeah. And it's like, man, I, and I come back with that. I always come back from there re-energized because it's like, I've been, I spent the last four or five days just meeting new people, talking and seeing what they're about, telling them what I'm about. And then I get back to DC and I'm like, why is everybody so mean? <laughs> you talk to me, oh, what do you do? I'm a financial analyst. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I deal with people in the Middle yeah. East. Oh, yeah, you like, I'm an artist, and then you're just like, I don't even want to explain, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but nah, it's dope though. Like, like you said, like it, everybody at some point should do something that teaches them something about that 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 field, whatever that is, because we all yeah, we all go out to eat. You know what I'm saying? I mean, but but maintaining those relationships and building those relationships, and it's like it also teaches you how to be the bigger man, right? Because right. you, you can never be the you're never in the right. Right, when you're exactly. when you're in customer service, it's always they're right, they're sure, right. I'll take care yeah, of it. Exactly. And and with us, there's so many times where someone promises you a gig mm-hmm. and it doesn't pan out, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and all you have to do is just be like swat around the bridge, like yeah. no worries, wait until yeah, next yeah. time, or or someone's a little late on a payment or something like that. It's like yeah. you're always constantly being the bigger man because exactly, it, like it always it because it always it always works itself out too. Like, it does. It, it does. People know when when people know when they've done you wrong or done right. something. So if you're just good, nice about it transparent about it you people usually will get you back in the exactly future. exactly and it might not be right away but i've learned like it's always best to go that route versus like there's been a couple of times where i've just like i i was in a bad situation and i really needed whatever was supposed to come to me and mm-hmm. it didn't come and i blew up and it's like damn like even though i might have been justified in like being upset i should have never like communicated that i was upset i should have just been like you said the bigger dude yeah and just because there's been times where I have taken that route as well. Same. And like you said, everything always finds a way to work itself out. It might not be on your clock, but it's on the clock that it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. So as long as you come comfortable with that and not expecting anything from anybody, like that might be a uh, rip from Gary Vee right there. Like he always says, oh, don't you're expect- big fan of Gary yeah. Vee. I love Gary yeah. Vee. Yeah, don't expect shit from anybody and you'll never be let down. You know what I'm saying? So like if you kind of like, it's kind of like, damn, that's kind of like cold blooded. <laughs> that's true. When you though, think though. about it. But at the end of the day, it's like, it is, it is right though. If I don't expect nothing from you, like anything that you do give me is, is all good. 
You know what I'm saying? No one can let you down at that yeah. point because it's like it's like you know worries. I had no expectations of you anyways. Like, right. Like no big deal. Right. And then if something does good happen, then it's like wow, you're blown away because you didn't expect nothing to happen in the first place. So that's another thing I've been practicing lately. Like just like just like you said, just going about my business. Yeah. Being professional. Um, always, you know, just being like the the better you know, the better man or better person in the situation. If something does go south, it's like, all right, it, it'll work itself out. Yeah, know? I found a few times that, like, I, I had ruined relationships or just messed up relationships because I was too worried about the financial. Mm-hmm. And because of that, mm-hmm. it, like, it, it took form into, like, lashing out at them. Where's my money? Where's right. this? Right. Like, I'm going to do this if you don't pay me. Right. And it's like, dang, like, I could have just waited a week and been patient. But because yeah. you're coming from, like, this desperation point and, yeah. like, you're in that moment. It's hard as an artist. You're it's freelancing. So hard. People it's don't like, understand. Yeah, you wake up every day and you got to you gotta, you gotta figure out how you're going to get fooled. You got to figure out how you're going to mm-hmm. pay the bills. You know, everybody needs a cell phone. That's just got to be on at all times. Like, there's a lot of stuff we got to pay for that everybody who has, you know, you know, regular, you know, jobs, they also, you know, have to take care of, too. But it's like they know exactly what they're going to get at that one week, two week mark. We might do better than we thought or worse than we thought. And we got to always stay composed. You know what I mean? Dude, I can't tell you how many months I went into it. Like, okay, I have no idea how I'm going to make money this month. And then by the end of the month, I'm like, oh shit, this all worked out. And then some, and I'm like, let's go. And then it restarts again. (laughs) Every every time. But it's always those relationships. I swear. It's it's like, for some reason they circle back or they find you back. And it it always happens at the right time Mm -hmm. too. Like I've noticed that man, like, I mean, at the end of the day, it's really just faith. You know what I'm saying? Like faith and you know, belief in yourself and whatever you're doing. This is what your this is what your calling is. And I've always believed that your gift will make room for you. You know what mm. I'm saying? So that's that you know, that's getting into some biblical right there. That's like you know, whatever you have, everybody's got a gift, and whatever your gift is, as long as you use it or you don't ignore it, it'll make room for you. It might not make a penthouse for you might be a basement apartment, but it'll be something for you. You know what I'm saying? And then eventually, if you keep at it, you can get to wherever you want to be. So, oh. I mean, that's just how I just, I just go, like, one day at a time and then just try to do the best every day. You well, know you're, you're a pretty uplifting dude naturally. Like, I saw you you did that whole thing with uh, the Speaking Your Dreams murals. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. mean, that's that's that kind of ties in with that. What's up with that? I saw that on your so, Instagram. Yeah, and that's funny because uh, the dude who, who sponsored the murals, he's based out in Cali. His uh-huh. He uh his name's actually billionaire. <laughs> people <laughs> people are like blown away when they hear it, but he he legally changed his name to billionaire because he believes that he's gonna um, inspire a billion people to speak their dreams into existence before he leaves this earth. No, oh, that is not and why so, I thought he would change his name like that. I thought because he's like, I'm gonna make my first Billy or I am right. billionaire. Right, and that's what everybody would think. And then when you hear the the reason behind it, you're like, damn, like this dude's written over 83 books, and they're all positive messages, quotes, and stuff like that. And um. So he, me and him had been following each other on social media. I like to follow like a lot of positive uplifting accounts. And um, so I had, you know, I've been seeing his work and he reached out to me because he's been trying to put up these murals Mm -hmm. all over, you know, most most of them are in Cali, but he's got them all over South Africa and now he's got two in D.C. And so, you know, he reached out to me to do the two that we had ended up doing here in D.C., and then we're actually doing a third one, uh, which I'll start this Saturday at Thompson Elementary mm-hmm. uh, downtown on uh, 14th and K. So th- that whole thing is... Um, you say you're yeah. starting that in a week? Yeah, I'm starting it this Saturday, so oh, in nice. a few days. And then, um, so that'll be, basically the, the whole point behind the murals are, you know, obviously the title of them are Speak Your Dreams to Existence, but then there's also a message that he puts on all of them where it says... You know, record yourself a one minute video standing in front of this mural saying whatever dream it is that you have and saying that you are going to speak it into existence. You're going to take whatever actions needed to act upon that dream. You're going to start now Mm. and you record that and you share it. Powerful stuff. You know, and so it's like it's all just, you know, getting people to just to really just like believe in whatever it is, because you got a lot of people that are working and doing jobs that they don't love, you know, and it's like, you know. At the end of the day, everybody needs money, so I get it, you know, and then you've been working there for so long, so you might be comfortable and and whatnot, but at the end of the day, you're not happy. So it's about achieving that happiness, and everybody can do it, you know, it's just not easy, you know what I'm saying? Do you find that putting those murals in specific parts of D.C., like, are they being put in, like, lower income areas they were honestly what happened was um so he doesn't you know i'm the feet on the ground out here because he's in Mm. he's based in cali so he doesn't have any connections to buildings or you know who would want work done or anything like that and so i was going door to door just asking owners of businesses and wherever i could see a blank wall at 
I was go and find out who owned that wall and <laughs> ask them if I could put a mural on there for free. Because basically, he's paying for it. I'm doing the work. Y'all just need to let me give, give me consent so I don't get arrested at you know midnight yeah. by the DC police <laughs> for vandalism. <laughs> for vandalism. And so I was, you know, I was just basically this is in the summertime. I was a guy on my bike or a scooter or whatever, and I was just like riding around DC. Whatever wall I seen that was empty, I would find out who the owner was, talk to them. I had written up a contract on my computer just to, so that they could sign over consent for me being on the premises and yeah, me putting on their walls. Yeah, you need something. Yeah, and then I would keep that in my back pocket. But basically, whoever hit me back first and gave me a yes, that was who got their wall painted. So I start, I, the first one I did was in uh, right behind uh, McDonald's on Bennett Road. Nice. And uh, they had, it was pretty much like a brick wall, but it was, you know, graffiti and all type of stuff over there. So I went in and talked to the owner of the McDonald's. Oh, he wasn't there. I talked to the manager, but he gave me the owner's information. And the owner said, yes, we would love to have it covered up. And I told him what I was putting. He was like, I'm all for it. Damn. So I did it in one night. I mean, I did it in one day. Oh. And then a week later, because I had been going around knocking on all these different businesses and stuff, one of the businesses in Union Market hit me, and they were like, yeah, we're ready for you to start. Like, whenever you want to start, you can, you know, we, we, we give you consent. And so I t- I called billionaire back up. I'm like, yo, we got another wall. If you you know if you trying to do another one, and he was like, man, let's do it. I showed him the location. This one was even better because Union Market, yeah, Union you know, Market's it gets a lot of traffic. Right and it's now. like literally like the first building that that's there, right across from the uh, w- wine bar. Yeah, Where's it's right it? across what, what? from the o- oyster bar. What'd you write on it? Um, this is the same thing. Speak your dreams to existence. Okay. It's got like a sky blue background with a butterfly and, and balloons, like a guy's being lifted by balloons. Oh, I feel like I've probably seen that. Yeah, you probably seen it. And um, we did that one, and then now we're getting ready to do the third one. Dude, it feels like the mural game is so strong. Like at least in DC, I don't know about yeah. the rest, but it seems like if you're an artist, like you're you're trying to do murals. Yeah, murals are good because they're you know they're bigger projects, so it's a bigger amount of money. You yeah, know? and then. Um, uh, out here in DC, you know, they're doing a lot of, you know, they got a lot of new buildings going up. <laughs> they got a lot of renovation going on. Big facts. And whether it's inside or outside, they need artwork. That's true. And so somebody's got to fill that void. I'm just like, I'm just happy to be here. I'm just happy to be a part of it. I mean, at the end of the day, like like you said, the murals. Those, those if you get a couple murals in. And if you know in a decent amount of time, like you, you'd be sitting pretty. Yeah, because I mean, I know they pay pretty well just from the outside. I don't know. Yeah, if I'm I mean, sure just because of well. the scale, they have to. Yeah. And then you add to that, you know, any design needs and you know materials and all that stuff. They gotta, they gotta cut a nice check because all that has to be compensated and paid for by them. And so, if you get around to knowing what your what your costs are gonna be. Uh, how you can present the right uh, design to actually win the contract because there's mm-hmm. gonna be competition over who gets it. Whoa. So presentation becomes a big key. Are you saying that like almost every wall probably has some sort of bid war over mural? Oh, for sure. Unless there's like an inside track to where the owners like are the whoever's doing uh, the uh, you know whoever gets the choice to pick the artist, unless mm-hmm. they have like a personal uh, connection or something, they know somebody and that's when they that's their guy. Other than that, it's like they have open bids. Uh, I just filled out one for for something over uh, in Brentwood. I mean. Uh, up Rhode Island and in, in, uh, Maryland, mm-hmm. and um, in the Gateway Arts District, they're doing nice. uh, they're doing a wall, and it's a, I think it was a twenty thousand dollar contract. Ooh, yeah, and it was like you know, some this is your deadline. Submit your resume, uh, you know, proofs of you know other work similar to this, and then we'll narrow it down to a top three. Notify you by this date, and then from then it'll be based on whatever designs that you submit and which one that we like the most mm. of those three artists. And so that's where the presentation comes in because I've learned this oh, wow. early that, you know, the way you the way you show them how you're going to do the work is big because I can come in there with a nice sketch that I've, you know, scaled out and everything. But it's, you know, it's a sketch or I could take pictures of the wall, go, you know, design it digitally on the computer and then project it in Photoshop on the wall oh, and show yeah. you exactly how that's it's going to look yeah. like almost like a 3d render mm-hmm. versus like you seeing the sketch and having the picture of oh, how is that going to look like I'll put it up there and like, it'll look like it's done already before I even touch it. Oh, that's and so, so perfect. That gives me the upper hand having that uh, graphic design background. Cause that's what I went to school for. Oh, nice. Yeah. I went to school for graphic design. So like 
again, now hindsight being 2020, I used to Works hate them with Photoshop and yeah, like, right. Man, this, I mean, I knew I was gonna always use those mm-hmm. skills, but I I thought it was gonna be like, you know, making a magazine in the mm-hmm. a newspaper joint or something. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? Like now I'm like. I know how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you, I mean, you're over here. Pitch, you're essentially pitching. Yeah, you're, you're like, pitching. Like, you're like pitching. an addict. Sales pitch. You're, you're pitching yeah, yourself. You're making your art. Dude, yep. that's got that's, that's epic. Whoa. Yeah, man. So like, that's that's the exciting part too. Because now I'm starting to really get good at that and like knowing what they're looking for and like I can even kind of uh, uh, alter my style to fit. Like I just did a hotel oh. in uh, Dupont right before the end of the year. Uh, Hotel 1600 They got the The new restaurant They're renovating And mm-hmm. it's called Truno is a new restaurant Which is on the inside mm-hmm. And it's like Super laid out Because everything's brand new They just renovated oh, yeah. it Yeah And they wanted it more like uh, I guess the best Artist to compare The style to Would be like a Picasso feel Okay Like very loose Abstract But you can kind of Still see that they're people mm-hmm. Because they had This artist that That uh did these renders inside the mirrors so they had these mirrors they put in the bathroom they had these mirrors they put in the bar and they each, they had these like line faces that would like cross each other so at first glance you're like oh that's kind of cool and you look and you're like oh that's two faces oh shit. so they wanted something like that so i like i met, i tailored the the pitch in that style oh you know like what you saying? used what they already had and brought that exactly in. yeah Dang. and they loved it and the next thing you know i'm, I'm starting i'm like Ooh. <laughs> right before christmas too Ooh, like, like, everyone's that. getting presents this year <laughs> yeah exactly that's, nah, that's, so, yeah. is that is that most of your work is the murals is that like a large percent of what you do now i would say it's like probably about 30 percent of what shit. i do i do a lot of commissions like smaller commissions on canvas and then <clears throat> initially i i really hated I, I left doing my graphic design job because I didn't like being locked in front of a computer and I felt very stagnant. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not using my hands. I'm just, like, I'm getting headaches. I'm staring at the screen. And so I got into this to this point where I was all about painting. Like, that's all I'll do. I won't touch. I won't do logos. I won't do none of that. Mm-hmm. And now that I've been doing so much painting, it's like, I'll, do, I'll make a logo here and there. And so I begin mm-hmm. a lot of logo, like, digital work lately. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I would say that's, like, that's about 20% of my workload right now is just doing digital t-shirt designs, uh, logos, and people's, you know, people's branding. Everybody's mm. everybody's getting to that point where they realize they can be their own brand. And everybody so at important. the end of the day needs brand identity. And so that I help them out with that. And um I've been I've been kind of like like uh filtering that into the workload a little bit. That's sick. Yeah, man. Dang. So what's the other 50? Uh I would say the other 50 is just like I started. I started making my own gear. So like, like that I, shirt, like that hoodie you got on. Yeah, this hoodie right here. Is, That's sick. It's, it's like a, Simba being held up. with wearing some J's. You wear some J's. So he's got the uh, the red and uh, the red and black. What are these? The twelves? No, these are the thirteens. I'm tripping. The red and twelve thirteens, and these are called. I mean, the red and black thirteens. These are called the breads. It looks like you hand painted that. So this was hand painted. Yeah. And then I. Um, I shot the painting and then uh, basically just like kind of traced out the outline in Photoshop and and uh, pressed it on the shirt. And then after I pressed it, I took a fabric paint, and outlined it to give it like some texture, oh. and you just let it dry overnight. And it's just like I, I I made this one last week, but I just started making like all my clothes because I'm having the auto show at the end of the month. So we can kind of set up our own booth near the car. Dude, we, it's so sick. I think having merch as an artist is so important. Bro, you have to. Like, like, like you have there's to. Been, there's been times where literally, like, I survived just off selling my prints. Like, oh. my 11 by 17 prints. Mm-hmm. Like, because, you know, me and you, we, we'll go somewhere. We'll, we'll spend $20 on something, you know, mm-hmm. if we like it. But we're not going to spend five hundred, thousand dollars $1,000 just off the, you know. No, oh, most people As aren't. much as I love this painting, I'm sure this painting is more than I can afford right now. I'm pretty sure that painting was fifteen to 2000 Yeah, exactly. And it's like, I love this painting, but I can't buy it. Yeah. But I could buy a print of it. Boom. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you got, you got to be able to reach everybody from, you know, from, your, you know, people who got the, you know, the extra income or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they really love the piece. And they, even if they want to set up a payment plan for you versus, you know, me and you were walking around. We just, we still love the art. No, you know, no cap to the artist, but we, you know, we can't afford it. Yeah. And so I still want a piece of it. I can frame it. I can make it look good. I'll put it up, you know, I'll put it up real nice. And then eventually I'll come back and get the original. Yeah. But it's like, it's like, you gotta have something for different price points because yeah. 
because most people, especially in art stuff, I'm like mm-hmm. unless you're in the fine art world, most people have money for a shirt or a right. brand or a right. paint or something like that. Right. But they're not going to be like, oh, ah, 1K, sure. I'll, yeah. make the, I'll make the art investment <laughs> of my life. Right. Take it. You got it. Yeah. And then it's almost like, you know, uh, you don't know, like, you don't know what that, I mean, if you're just passing by, you don't know who that artist is or, you know what I'm saying? So it's like. It's kind of like a blind buy almost. Mm-hmm. Like you want to, you want to, if you're buying somebody's work, you, you're actually becoming a collector. So you're going to want to know about the artists. You want to know about, you know, upcoming shows of that nature. But having those price points is so important because you want to be able to reach everybody from, you know, from Bill Gates to Bill, Bill Bo. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, <laughs> wants a fly Bill Bo. <laughs> but no, yeah, that's, that's important. I survived literally like there's been times where I set up, I did pop ups. And I would do like a live painting. So like my goal was to sell a live painting, of course, for like a couple hundred. But I would end up making a couple hundred in prints. <laughs> ten, you know, ten prints at twenty it, bucks. It that's two hundred. Yeah, it adds, so it adds up. And um, yeah, man. So there's definitely like, and that's something that you would only learn by just going through the going through the rigor of like trying to figure out okay how can i make money if i don't sell my work actually like <laughs> there's got to be a way <laughs> yeah it, it, it's it's funny it's like it's you, you make all your money by not selling the art right in a right. weird way you're selling the art, but not really it's like yeah. you're selling the brand you're selling the message you're mm-hmm. selling the, the clothes and and or whatever conduits you have and it's like oh i sold a piece of art fuck yes yeah there's been times where i've had pieces for three or four years and then they <laughs> they would sell after you know a couple years but if i would have been like banking on that the sell as soon as I finished, I'd have been screwed. And so I, you know, you you kind of develop this numbness or this kind of like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you just don't you don't really depend on like the original selling. You're just making sure that the the engine's running smoothly. And then if the 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 original does sell, it's like you getting the speed boost, yeah, or the turbo boost. And so now you're really on fire. And then you can ride that out till you sell the next one. Yeah, I noticed you do a lot of like public i wouldn't say public stunts but you're like you're you're just not embarrassed at all to to paint something and then bring it in public yeah yeah i love doing that what's the I thought mean, behind that because like it doesn't do me any it doesn't do me any good or anybody else if it's just sitting in my house mm-hmm. and it's like yeah, i had this great art that i've been spending all this time making and now i'm the only one that gets to see it like mm-hmm. something's wrong with that like i gotta get it out in front of other eyes so if there's an event going on like like when the when the uh the nats won yeah I did a painting like the night before the parade and took it out there. And it's just dope like seeing people's reaction. Like, oh, wow. Like, it's so, it was big one too. Yeah. And they're like, wait, you just painted because they just won. You, they was down. I saw you were, you were like on top of a truck holding this yeah. giant canvas. I was like, like people show love. Like, literally, I just took the painting out of my house. I got on, I walked it to the Columbia Heights Metro because it's so big. You can't put it in an Uber. Uh-huh. You didn't want to Uber there anyway. Yeah, that's true. You can't. And so, that. get down to, I think I got off at like LaFont. Or archive, I got off at of archives, and I walked the painting up the escalator. And like even before I get off the train, like people were like stopping me taking pictures. Like, I couldn't even get up the street. And then once I got out, actually on the street, I was trying to get it to where like the the the, the trucks bringing everybody by, like the parade could see it. Uh-huh. But it was so hard because it was so big, and then it was like literally like land people locked. You know, yeah, shoulder to I was shoulder. there. It was insane. Yeah, it was insane. So finally, I got behind one of the museums. And uh, trying to cut through the back way so I could get by the stage, and there was this big semi that had they had parked to block out one of the streets, and there's people having like, they were like taking like beer, uh, what, what's oh beer called? bongs, beer bongs to their head on top. <laughs> I'm like yo, they're getting it in up there, and then they see it like yo, That's some white yo. people shit. Yeah, they're like yo, let me see that painting, bro. So I turn, <laughs> I turn around, they're like. Bring that shit up here. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, like, next thing you know, I'm on top of a semi, like partying with a bunch of strangers. Did and you, it was fun. Did you though. beer bong? I didn't. I took a shot. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm more of a shot guy. Okay. So they had some whiskey up there. I took a shot. I took a couple shots, as a matter of fact. But you, then, you, I uh, saw you also, you also did it for the Nipsey Hustle thing, too. Nipsey, yeah, took it out to his candlelight vigil. And um, that was dope because, like, I didn't, I, you know, I was so, like, I I was at the time I was working the auto show. That was like when it first started. So I was kind of focused on that, but I knew I wanted to do something. Mm-hmm. So I painted the Nipsey painting without even knowing that the candlelight vigil was happening. Oh wow! I just did it because I wanted to take it up to the convention center so people could see it. So I took it up that morning. Next thing you know, like we're on the news. Like the news, the news guy was walking through, like in the, in the early where everybody was setting up, and he's like, "Yo, is that Nipsey Hustle?" Like. 
<laughs> you know, ba, I think his name is Ba. I forget his last. Wait, name. were you name, were, were you just coincidentally in the same city that the vigil was in? Well, they had they had one in D.C. Oh, okay, okay. They had okay. one in a, a lot of different cities, okay. but the D.C. one was happening that night actually. So I didn't oh. even know about it that morning. So we was on the news that morning with the painting, and then throughout the course of the day, people was texting me like, "Yo, you need to take that paint. You need to take that painting to Malcolm X Park at six because they're doing the candlelight vigil." Oh snap! And I was like, I was low key like so tired because. T- to bring the painting there that morning, I had stayed up the whole night before to paint it. <sighs> Plus, my mom was in town, so I was chilling with her the whole day before. And then when we got back to my uncle's house that night, I was like, you know what? I was about to go to sleep, and then I was like, nah, fucking, I'm staying up all night. That's that hustle. So I did it, yeah. I, th- 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 hey, that's that you thinking about being a waiter and serving tables, being like, I don't yes. ever want to go back. Dude. Right. I never want to go <laughs> back. No, I'm never going back. And so I did the painting that night, finished at like 7.30 a.m., drove to, to the convention center from my uncle's house, get in the convention center on the news at like 9.30, and then the candlelight vigil was at 6. So I called an Uber, took it straight to the candlelight vigil. When I get there, I was already kind of late. So like it was like the same situation. There's all these people, and literally I didn't know like how I was going to get to the front or nothing. Damn. So I'm like, I'm kind of just walking with it, and then you know people slowly started noticing it. So as I'm taking pictures... My boy that I used to work with at the restaurant, uh, my boy Jason, and uh, he's Go like, figure. he's like, yo, he's like, yo, Perk, and I'm like, yo, what's up, bro? What you doing? Out here? He's like, man, I came for the uh, candlelight vigil. He's like, you, you got a painting? And I was like, yeah. So I showed him. He was like, bro, we're taking that to the front. What? I was like, how? He was like, just hold it up, and everybody's gonna move out your way. <laughs> It was like it was like some Moses shit. Like I held a painting up, and literally like the shit just started parting, and everybody's just like everybody's like back up, back up, back up. It's like literally like I had like the the Ten Commandments in my hand, and I'm going all the way to the front. I get to the front, and they turn around and they're like, and this is what we're talking about right here: young artists taking their creative initiative. Damn, to help honor this man. I'm like, yo, I'm just holding it up, like yeah. What were you thinking at that, bro? I was like, man, I couldn't. I was like at a loss for thoughts like i was just like so happy just to be there and like just to be like part of the event yeah because I, I had met nipsey like uh a year and a half before that mm-hmm. at broccoli fest and he was, i gave him a painting actually and he was like exactly which how you think it'd be like super cool super humble and you know he's got all these gold chains on me he's sitting there like dapping me out talking to me like i'm one of his boys and so it was just like, I felt like I had like a connection. Plus, I had been listening to his music for like 10 years. Because he oh, came, wow. Nipsey came out like 2009. He's been around. Yeah, people just like, they don't know about because he's always been independent. And so unless you're like from Cali, you know somebody from Cali that bangs his music, you probably mm-hmm. didn't hear about him if you're on the East Coast till like he had a couple of joints that really went popping. And so I had, I had built up this like, this whole like, I don't know, fandom of, of, of Nip. And so when, it, when he passed... That shit like hit me, you know what I'm saying? It's like I felt yeah, like I lost like a cousin or somebody, and so when I was at the candlelight vigil holding a painting, up, it was just like, dang, this shit is crazy. And then Michael Eric Dyson, the uh, the uh, political activist, he ended up buying the painting Damn. off me right then and there, yeah. Boom. Because I had I still had the swiper from the uh, the auto show when I was <laughs> oh selling my, my prints. So I pulled finesser. out I pulled out the uh, square. He's like he's like, I want this. I said I said, are you sure? He's like, yeah. I was like, well, you know, I told him the price. He was like, I'm ready to pay right now. He was like, you take Amex? I was like, sure do. <laughs> <laughs> Swiped him right there. Dude, how much you selling for to him? A thousand. Damn, yeah, that's thousand, pretty yeah. sweet right there on the spot, too. Yeah, I did it probably like six, seven hours. But it was like, it was, for, for me, really, like, I didn't think he was going to actually buy it. So I just threw a number out there. I, now, looking back, I'd be like, man, 5,000. You you're in the like, moment. Like, any, yeah, you, you, you like, could have been like, yeah, you could have been like, five, been like oh, fuck it. He already yeah. said it. Yeah. <laughs> And plus, he's trying to stunt in front of everyone, exactly. too. You know? Oh, and that's exactly what he did, too. Because we got that, man. He was, like, getting magic, man. <sighs> Tell him. That's awesome, dude. But, like, see, that takes so much balls as an artist to do. Like, yeah. to, I mean, to stay up all night, six, seven hours, and paint that, that mm-hmm. says one thing, because you already have a good thing to say. But then to, mm-hmm. to have the strength and the cojones to bring it to the event, yeah. like, most artists wouldn't do that. Yeah. At least most artists I know. Right. No, I, once I made it, I was like... I got it. Like it came out Like usually when I Stay up all night I'll, there'll, there'll still be like Other things that I want To add to it Or do something the next day But that It was like When I finished I was like I was literally done with it Like I've never mm-hmm. felt that way About a piece where I was like Alright I don't have to Do nothing else I don't have to touch it yeah. Like it's perfect how it is And I was like That's crazy bro Like I think that's cause Of the actual connection That I had with him 
Like, if I was just doing something random, it probably wouldn't have been like that. But, like, since I felt so powerful and strong about it, like, every stroke was, like, intentional. And when I was done, I was done. Yeah, because, I mean, I can imagine that. It's like someone you've listened to for years yeah. and you just probably learned so much game from. Like, and he was so young, too. Like, he's, yeah. like, a couple years older than me. You know what I'm saying? Like, Damn. How old are you? I'm 32. Oh, no way. Yeah. I, get, I thought you were like 28 or something. Nah, man. I'm old, man. I'm 30, gray 32 is not shit. that old. <laughs> I, I mean, don't look at my hair, bro. I, I literally pulled out two gray hairs this morning. I was like, <laughs> like, they were like right in the front, too. I was like, I was like, you know, I don't normally do this, but I was like, these yeah. are just extra ugly. I was like, Think. and you know what? The gray ones are like, they're more like stronger and Have coarse. You, you notice that, too? Yeah, I'm like, it's not a regular hair follicle. This is like three of them in one. Dude, like, I was legit holding it. I was like, I thought the same thing this morning. I was yeah. like, why the fuck is this hair like a horse hair? Yeah. I was like, super coarse. Like, like, what the fuck? Like, I was like, I was like, are you trying to cock block me? Here? Yeah, like, what is going on? Nah, it's just crazy. And it's like they're so noticeable. Like it could be one string of gray hair, and you could see that joint from a mile away. Like, damn, <sighs> dude, but you're telling I'm me. In, I'm starting to learn to embrace them because I got them popping up on the sides like crazy. So hey, you know, I'll take grays over going bald any day. Man, what? I'll take my hairline over gray hair yeah, any day. Yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take a full head of gray right here. Now, if, you, <laughs> if you promised me I'd never go bald, I'll take a full head of gray right, right now. Right, we right, can right. Do it. Silver fox it out. Yeah, because. <laughs> Hair dye is a thing, but mm-hmm. getting hair implants, I ain't got no money for Mm-mm. that. That's wild stuff. If LeBron can't fix his hairline, I have no faith in me <laughs> fixing mine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't know how he can fix a hairline when Magic Johnson can cure AIDS. That's kind of right. no, wild. Man. Though. Hey, a lot of stuff Magic does. I'm like, Shh, only Magic can do that. <laughs> Dude, I actually heard a re- I, I, oh, fuck. I, I need to be more factual when I talk about stuff, but this is a podcast, so I don't need to be factual. But yeah. Something I heard like heard Magic Johnson's sex schedule like because he was like the dude in the time. Oh yeah, and I, if I remember correctly, someone was saying that he would he would bang like over five hundred chicks a year. Like yeah, like yeah. I'm pretty sure there's a lot more than that. Like he would he would wake up, go bang a girl before practice, yeah. get out of practice, meet up with another girl, go to dinner, then go home, and there'd be like we're, girls waiting in the lobby in yeah. queue for him He's to mad. choose which one he wanted to bang with. So I'm like, of Think course, about he it. Caught before AIDS. Jordan, before Jordan, he was he was like the shit. Like he was like. If anybody would have made a goat list at that time, he'd have been at the top. I mean, him and maybe uh, uh, Kareem, mm-hmm. but Kareem was still playing. And, but uh, you know who else was, who was worse than him? Who? Will Chamberlain. No way, bro. He's notoriously known no. for like getting it in. Like, Jesus. And there's a book or like some stuff, but like they used to make jokes like he's he's hit over a hundred thousand. Hundred like, thousand. <laughs> and I'm like, when you do the math, it's really like impossible, unless he was just like nonstop hitting a different shape. Every second I, of the day, I mean, but you like, think like these dudes have so much testosterone, no, they could was, probably nut like five times in a And they, day, they said, dude. you know, Will Chamberlain, like he was like a freak, like like you know, not like Giannis. Like they said, he was like strong, like yeah. he could lift up grown men with like one arm. Damn. Yeah, like if you there's a, there's a YouTube video bad for those females, Jesus, <laughs> bro. There's a YouTube <laughs> well, video, dog. <laughs> okay, okay, walk out the word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, girl walking out sideways. Oh, you just want the Will Chamberlain, right? <laughs> Yeah, girl, I gotta lay up for the rest of the day. <laughs> wait, wait, nah. no, wait. What's the YouTube video? What's the YouTube video? It's a YouTube video, and it, it it says like the seven like freakish freakishly things about Will Chamberlain that you never knew, like insane human strength type things. Like he oh. lift up cars, and he was just like he was probably the strongest man that ever played in the NBA to this day. And and uh, wow. when you when you hear some of the stories that people talk about him, it's like. Bro, that dude was crazy. Though. I mean, like, you gotta be. I mean, to be an elite athlete at the top of your game, yeah. and and to be one of the most popular people in America, because at that mm-hmm. time all they had was television. Mm-hmm. You know, so you are the dude. Mm-hmm. It, it, and it's I, not like you can flip to a college game, like nah. Like that's all you, <laughs> you have. Saying? So that's would, all you got. Like, that in the news, that's and so a late crazy. night show. That's so crazy, man. Bro, bro. How, how do we get there as an artist, bro? How do we bang hundred thousand girls a year? Hey man, you can do anything you put your mind to. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go on enough dates for that, bro. They gotta like line themselves outside of my apartment. Nah, to do that. I'm, man, I recently just got in a relationship. So I was I'm about like, to ask you, yeah, how, yeah. How, how, what's your status? So I had been single for like six, probably since right before, or right when I started painting. Oh wow! And so this whole journey of, as an artist, I kind of like really. Uh, it's probably why you're so productive. Yeah, I really focused on that shit, man. Especially when I first started, and then when you first, when I first started, I was like sleeping on the couch, like, you know, I'm trying to, I'm, I was barely bringing any money. You can't, I didn't even have enough money to take a girl on a date. You can't let alone a invite her over. You can't afford to go like, get drinks with, with a girl. You like, you want to come watch TV with me? Like, you know what I'm <laughs> saying? You trying to Netflix and chill? Yeah. And so, like, most of my fun and like yeah. dating and stuff happened like just ca- very casually. But yeah. Uh man, finally, finally found one that I really like. I'm really feeling, you know, I love her and, and all that. So oh, just seeing awesome, how man. that seeing how that uh, works itself. How'd you out. meet her? 
Do Instagram. My man. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking in my head. I was like, I was like, DMs? Yeah, DMs, man. Uh, yeah, no Tinder, plenty of fish, none of that. Just straight IG. And we had been following each other for a minute, but we never really, uh, you know, engaged with each other until until recently, uh, mm-hmm. last year. And so, yeah, it's been cool, man. It's kind of like, kind of forgot what it felt like to be in a relationship, but it's it's dope, though. Like, How's it going? It's, go- it's going good. It's, I mean, you know, it's just a honeymoon phase. You oh, know oh so how fresh is this? Uh, like a couple months. A few oh, months, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's fresh. But uh, no, nah, she's a good person. And she she uh, makes me feel better as a, as a man and doing what I'm doing. And she's very supportive. So, yeah, man. It's, it's I mean, that's, that's the hardest thing as an artist that people don't talk about is just relationships. Because it's like once as an artist, you have enough money for relationships, you probably yeah. have enough clout to get a lot of girls. Yeah. And so it's like you, you can kind of like do what you want in a sense, but then all of a sudden it becomes a thing where it's like, okay, yeah, I can get girls, but who's going to like really support me yeah, and like be okay with yeah. me being the weirdo I am? Exactly. And it, you know, like 10 years ago, I, you know, I probably wouldn't, I probably would just be rocking like my, by, by myself, but you know, I'm older now and uh, I, I've had my whole, I went, you know, I went to school out here. I've been a bachelor out here. Like mm-hmm. I've been to every club in, <laughs> in DC. Yeah. You know, I've had my wild nights and all that, all that fun stuff. So it's like, I can, I can, I still like, I, I like having fun a different way now. Like I like I like making a nice dinner. You know what I'm saying? That's that grown man shit. Yeah, dude. I'm like, with you on that, dude. Yeah, like focusing on like my goals, you know, and things that they're gonna help me get to the next level. And like you need a partner when you're doing stuff like that. You know That's what I'm so saying? That's so true. I mean, you don't need one, but it's better if you have one. You it, know I mean, it's saying? like a support system. It's like a friend. It's gonna bounce ideas it off. Is, of. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, and it, somebody that's got yeah. your back. At the end of the day, you know, you want somebody that's gonna have your back. Mm-hmm. Like your friends, you know, your friends might not always be able to be there because they got their own shit going on. And so it's like, oh no, nah, you you my girl, you gotta have my back. <laughs> it's like it's like you just signed up to be my best friend, right. my girlfriend, <laughs> person I'm having sex with, person yeah. told my secrets too. It's like, yeah. oh man, sorry about that. Facts, facts. So it's nah, crazy. it's dope though. It's dope though. I like it a lot, man. I see where it goes. That's awesome. Yeah, I think Instagram's a great place to meet pe- to meet like women or just meet people in general. Because it's super it, casual. You just you just it's like you attract people into your orbit in a yeah. way, and like you have similar interests and stuff. It's not like it, somebody is not gonna follow you if they don't like fuck with you in some type of capacity exactly like, like something that you do something about you that makes them want to makes you makes them want you to pop up on their timeline mm-hmm. or whatever it is their feed and so uh yeah and it, and it like it wasn't like something that we just met or we had just started following each other we've been following each other for a couple of years mm-hmm. and so i just thought, always thought she was dope but from afar you know what i'm saying that's cool and uh it was finally it was it was dope finally like interacting in person and like kind of Cause you know you have this perception about when somebody what somebody might be like, and then you meet them, it's like oh shit, oh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? That's always really weird. But but her, it was like oh shit, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like hey, yeah, okay, this is better than online. Yeah, That's so no, nah, it was dope. Dude, can we talk about your uh, peekaboo thing you're doing right now? Yeah, peekaboo what? is a series of paintings. Um, right now, the series is standing at three, one complete, and two in the works. Uh, But that's a series about, like, highlighting, like, figures, basically, like, very, you know, you can be spiritual figures, historical figures. Can we talk about the one that got uh, robbed from you? Yeah, so that one's called Pensamento, and that was, like, that was, like, something that I set up myself uh, on the National Mall, and the whole idea behind it was... um, not to create any type of hysteria, which it kind of did, mm-hmm. but just to um, create a hysteria. What do you mean to create a hysteria? Well, you know, like people do sh- people do things for shock value and stuff like that nowadays, and that wasn't necessarily like the the reason behind it. I want to do something creative with the piece that could tie into it as a concept as a whole. Mm-hmm. So, like the whole the whole concept behind the first piece, uh, basically, it started out with me. Uh, googling what was the most expensive painting ever sold and i just you know i just wanted to know like there's a, there's always a new one being sold and breaks the record like i think basquiat had one a few years ago and then most recently it was Le- leonardo uh, da vinci's um salvatore mundi which is basically it was a lost da vinci that got rediscovered jesus as a print somebody got it they thought it was an artist print and they went to go get it. They went to go get it restored. And as they're like peeling back the layers, the lady's like, "I think this is Da Vinci." No took fucking it. way. He took it to some lady in uh, France, and as in the restoration uh, period was like over a course of like a few years. So mm-hmm. she's like slowly like 
because there's somebody had went over with some red pain and people put, like, a beard on them. out restoring a da vinci oh my yeah God. and so as she's restoring it she's starting to realize like this might be a, a real da vinci and so Whoa. basically at the end of the restoration process they got it they went they took it to like a, a board of scholars who all specialize in his work and his style and all that and they authenticated it wow took it back to new york and the owner auctioned it off at christie's and I think it went for like four hundred and fifty million. What? So almost half a billion dollars. Yeah. Holy. For a painting, shit. and the painting is like not even as big as this. And um, how, like how uh, big? Like, like people listening don't know what this is. Well, like, uh, it's a little bit smaller than this. Like, but like eight by ten? No, 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 no. It's like probably about like a thirty six by twenty four. I think it's thirty by forty. Damn. For but half yeah, a half a billion. Dollars. And so it was bought by a Saudi prince, and he put it in like. The du- in Dubai, they have their own version of the Louvre, mm-hmm. and so it's in there. That's awesome, then. Yeah, and it's... Uh, it's for the culture right there. Yeah, for the culture. And uh, so I'm looking at this painting, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I've seen that before. And it's basically a picture of, like, a white Jesus. And so I'm like, yeah, I've seen, I've definitely seen this image before. He's holding, like, the, the divinity sign with his hands up. And, with, with his um, fingers crossed like that. Yeah, so it's like the it's this like, is like the sign of divinity when it's it, got like the like your your middle finger over your yeah your, it's your like your a gentle finger. like not crossed too hard but very gentle uh huh and um, that's like I had to look that up too I'm like what is he doing it's like Jesus throwing up gang signs yeah what doing? like <laughs> forks <laughs> he's but, like uh, holy spirit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True shit. And so, uh, yeah, have you seen that video where he's like, the power of Christ compels you with the, with what? the it's like this Mexican no. inmate, and he's like, the power of Christ compels you. I seen this video, and it was this dude, and he's like, he remixed like a gospel song. He's like, you don't fuck with Christ, I'm gonna kill you. And he's oh like, <laughs> I was like, yo. <laughs> okay, okay, so what were you we saying about that? So, so I, I started researching the painting because I'm like, why did this painting go for so much? Okay, yeah. and I'm, it's a Da Vinci, so that, that took it to this, and then, okay, so that, okay. I'm like, all right. So then I started researching, like, well, this is back when in the 1500s, 1400s, like, they didn't have camera phones. So, like, who was, who did he look at to paint? You know what I'm saying? To paint his depiction of Christ. Uh, Interesting. And so, come to find out, the Pope was the one who commissioned him to do the painting. And so, allegedly, as his model, he Uh used the Pope's son's boyfriend. Which I thought was interesting because I'm like, this is painted in Christ. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The yeah. Pope's son's boyfriend. Yeah. Okay. And there are there are some like stories that Da Vinci himself might have been homosexual, and so I just thought this was like an interesting twist. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't. I was like, whoa, where'd this come whoa. from? And so, wait, are you telling me right now that our replicas of Jesus are off of gay Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> that's what. That's what that's I. Awesome. That's what I like. That's what I found out. And it, all of this wild. is, of course, like this so long ago. Like nobody yeah. can really, like, nobody can really like make it facts. But this is a story that I've yeah. been told. Yeah. And so I'm like, all right, that's kind of crazy. Um, maybe like I've always wanted. I've always considered myself as wanting to be one of the greats. And so I was like, maybe I should do my own interpretation of Christ. Mm-hmm. Like that's like a very prominent figure obviously and everybody knows about him and so I, I i i took it upon myself to to paint my version of christ coming through da vinci's version of christ which made which made me have to paint da vinci's version first so i could paint mine over it that's wild yeah what was so, that like trying to paint a da vinci dick? man you don't realize how masterful he was until you really zoom in on his on his on his work and mm-hmm. look at like each stroke is like it's crazy it's how detailed it is, and it's like he doesn't he there is no there is no transition from one color to the next. It kind of just blends. Ooh, and that and then when you look at it, all his figures had that smoky feel to them because you can't see one color go from you know it, it has to change colors or so it just be white. But it's like when you there's no like you can't tell where where beige becomes light beige or white or a highlight or wow. dark brown. Like it's all like. Just one transition. And so when you really like start to work and start to paint like him, I was crazy. I was like, damn, this dude was the truth. You know what I'm saying? You start to realize what made him so great. Yeah, yeah. And then um, putting mine over it. I didn't want to just put mine over it. So mine looks like it's kind of like ripping the canvas and he's coming from the painting. And so I I was like, man, I got to do something dope with this just to like, I want to, I want to, I want to show like a lot of people at one time and I could just post it or I could do something creative. And so I was like, I came up with this idea to have it 
stolen, quote unquote, mm. in front of the national, in front of the monument, because I could have did it. I could have did it on, you know, right outside here, but nobody yeah. would know this block. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And so I was like, I had to do something visually stimulating so that no matter who sees it they'll know exactly where i'm at ah oh, makes sense and then that might even draws more draw more focus or more like questions like how did this happen in front of the monument like isn't there secret service like yeah. you know what i'm saying like all these you know all this stuff versus it just being in front of my house it like, also makes sense it gets it get stolen from the monuments because there's so many people around there yeah yeah so we went out there uh me and my boy went out there he filmed and I set it up on the easel. I was acting like, oh, I was like painted it at first, you know, people walking by. And then my other boy who was supposed to come up there, he hit me at the last second. He was supposed to be the one that took it. Mm-hmm. And he did, he wasn't able to come. And so I'm like, fuck. I'm like, nah, we're already out here. Like, we're about to do this today. I'm like, we're just going to find somebody. So people kept walking by. And finally, we seen this one dude. He was by himself. And I was like, yo, I was like, let's ask him. <laughs> that's, that's gotta be a random ass yeah. right so we go out to him like yo bro i know this is super random like can you just act like you, can you just act like you you like you picked up and ran off with this painting <laughs> i was like i'll pay you like i'll give you like money like whatever you like eh, you, we won't release your name or anything like that like and he's like he's like oh no worries bro like i'll do it for free he's like i'm visiting from australia and i fly back home tomorrow <laughs> he's i'm like, like I give a shit. yeah i'm like bet that's perfect because <laughs> I know people are going to be on your head. Yeah. <laughs> and so literally two takes and his name was Steve. Shout out Steve. Shout out Steve, man. Australian Steve, man. So Steve did it the first time and I was like, I don't need it to be long and, and dramatic. I just need I just need to see the camera, like see you take it and then start to run after you. And then I was like, drop the camera and make it go to the ground with cut the black. Ooh, it was so believable yeah. too. I saw the video. I was like, because I was like, the more footage you get, people, the more they're able to dissect it and be yeah. like, oh, no, this is ain't real. It happened like within seven, eight seconds, and so it happened so quick. It was like it really made you wonder, like, did this just happen? And then like, so I I set it up on on Instagram because I you know I'm acting normal, and um, I had made I had filmed this like four or five days before I actually dropped the video on IG. So I had already edited it and had oh, everything set up. you're ready. Yeah, and then once I dropped it, like I, that day I, on my story, I had I had uh, uploaded the videos of me taking it on the mall, oh, on the train with it. Wow, and then my, my next story post was like, I can't believe this just fucking happened, like all angry faces and then nothing for like three hours. And then at, right after that, I dropped a video of it getting stolen. What? And I'm like, oh, I put, I put, uh, my guy's Instagram name is Mr. CO87. I said, Mr. CO87, I need the footage ASAP. And I've got, I've already got the footage sitting right in yeah, front of me. Yeah, you just I'm wait. Like, I need the footage ASAP yeah. so we can tell everybody. Yeah, we, we can find this yeah. guy. And then I dropped it and it just like 500 comments. It went like, crazy? Bruh, crazy. People in the comments, like, oh, from everything from there's no way he could have got away to I think you just pulled a Jesse Simulette to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to I, I freeze framed and we're going to find him. No and way. If we see him anywhere, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yo, this shit is crazy. Like, wow. I, I knew it was going to get attention, but not that much. Like, really? Were people, like, really freaking out in there? Bro, the news hit me. No. NBC hit me and they're like. Um, we'd love to do an interview with you talking about the oh, theft. Oh, no. What do you and do I'm at like, that point? I'm like, I'm like, yo, before we even talk, I need to speak to you off the record. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. OTR. OTR, baby. Off the it's, record. It's like, it's like you didn't realize how big yeah. of a problem this would cause. And so he's like, yeah, that's, sure, that's fine. That's fine. Like, Because they were, they were like literally like harassing me, like trying to get in contact. They really wanted that story. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, let me speak to you off the record. So I talked to the dude. I told him like everything. He was like, oh, okay. He was, he was like, like, damn. He's like, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. He's like, but we're also not going to further like run with this story. <laughs> You're like, duh. Yeah. And I was like, I figured that, which is why I told you. <laughs> and But nah, I had friends that were officers that were hitting me up like, what? I'll go get the surveillance tapes. No like, we way. Can get, we, I'll pull the tapes from the mall. Like, I'm like, bro, y'all I gotta chill. <laughs> Wait, so why, why did you do it? Like, why, why, why did you want to do that anyways? Uh, I just it was like I said, it, go, it all goes back to the to the whole like concept behind it. So basically, the concept behind Peekaboo are like we we're we've been raised in a society and environment where we see certain images or certain things that have happened so long ago that we we take them as truths or as facts, mm-hmm. even though like 
something could have happened before that, but this is the thing that we've chose to focus on, or this is the thing that's been presented to our reality versus really finding out what's going on or trying to like dig below the surface. You're just taking it for face value and running with it. Right. And so other than the Jesus piece, the other piece was uh, Otis, Otis Blackwell. Mm -hmm. He's a guy that's responsible for like 60% of uh, Elvis's catalog, like writing his songs and all that. And uh, yeah. And he's, you know, he's got his own catalog of music, but he's wrote like a lot of Elvis's smash hits and you would never even like, like nobody's ever even heard of him, Whoa. but he's like responsible or for you know responsible for some of the songs by the the King of Rock. Yeah, and so it's like you think his name would get mentioned or something like that, and you never like I didn't hear about him until I like started researching. And so the the one of the pieces is a picture, a like, iconic picture of Elvis, and then Otis oh, Blackwell like coming ripping through the canvas, oh. and then another one was uh, Jack Daniels. Mm-hmm. Jack Daniels, uh, we all know who Jack Daniels is. We all know what his drink is, right? He got his recipe from a sharecropper, a black sharecropper that you know w- that he employed, and the uh, the sharecropper was the one that gave Jack Daniels the recipe to make his whiskey. No way. Yeah, and so it's like this guy's name was, uh, uh, I think it was Joe Nearest, mm-hmm. and and now he's got his own. Uh, his own whiskey called Uncle Nearest, which mm-hmm. is like super top shelf. And it just shows you like, man, like you, these people, like we don't know about them. Like they're almost like hidden figures behind like these prominent figures. Yeah. It's like all these black people who are responsible for yeah. very notorious and prolific yeah. things in, in America or yeah, in the world. Exactly. And, um, and you know, not that, not that, because, you know, Jack Daniels is the one that actually came out with it and all that. But it's the credit. Like, nobody gives him the credit no one, for, no one for, for throwing it. him the alley-oop. He gave Jack the alley-oop for the, yeah. for the recipe. And then just to further authenticate that story, he's got his own Top Shelf whiskey. You know what I'm saying? Uncle Nears whiskey. I've and never so, heard of it, though. You've yeah, been, and it's like... Have you had it? Yeah, it's super smooth. It's like 60 a bottle. <sighs> but, um, yeah, so, like, the the whole the whole thing of the guy stealing the painting is almost mm-hmm. like he stole a piece of history and ran off with it and then cut the black. Oh. You know what I'm saying? And so that can kind of be tied into like how we have these other pieces of history that have been stolen from us or not necessarily stolen from us but hid from us, and then it cuts the black and then we just take whatever we see for truth and face value when there's these other people that are part of the story but that we talk- never learned about. You're talking about things stolen from you as like as a black <clears throat> culture. I mean, to anybody. I mean, no matter black, white, gray, yellow, you, you kind of want to know, like, certain things, like, about, like, you know, your history. Yeah. You know, and so if it's been shown a certain way and that's not the full truth, you're going to want to know, too. I mean, you those are saying? very interesting examples. I had yeah. no idea about any of that stuff. You just yeah. blow my mind the whole time. Yeah, man, I'm telling you, bro, like, and, and then we, I'm sure there's more. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like so these, these are just the ones I found out about it in my, my small time of research and just coming up with concepts for the first three paintings, but... Mm-hmm. My my goal is to continue it and to keep the keep the number growing up until it gets to like ten or so, and then having the the ex, if you know having the exhibit, and so yeah, it's just that'd that was a, what sparked it though. Like that'd be whole, a crazy exhibition, especially if you like <clears throat> type those out and like let people know, for sure, like give yeah. them that backstory ahead for sure, of time. For sure, yeah, that'd be so crazy. Yeah, but, that, but I mean, I, I say that when because it's I mean it's your experiences, right? And you're a mm. black artist in America, but. I've noticed that with your art, even two years ago, mm-hmm. when I first saw stuff, it's very social activist driven. It's very, yeah. uh, like, it, you're very aware of social issues in yeah. America or just around yourself. Yeah. Uh, see, my whole thing is I'm not, I don't, I've never been, like, the guy that likes to, like, talk a lot mm-hmm. or be, like, super vocal. I like to voice my opinion, but I'd rather do it through my art mm-hmm. because it's not like when somebody says something, that's what they said. But if I paint something, that could be kind of, like, perceived as what I said, but it also can be sp- be perceived as something different mm. so it invites others to kind of like meet me at a middle ground or like kind of see where i could be coming from even though they don't know for sure they're just looking at an image and then seeing what that image means to them so i like that whole aspect of being able to voice my opinion or voice my thoughts about very like serious issues without being necessarily being quoted or being like my words being tied to like how i feel how i feel could be how you feel too yeah, Maybe we get we could f- both feel the same way, but look at it differently. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, that was my whole approach with that. Like, there's been a lot of times where, like, even with the H and M thing, when that when that happened, where they had oh, the, yeah. the kid wear the coolest monkey in the jungle. Yeah, like I could have I could have Facebook ranted and made a you know made a like a post, 
and you know cussing out H and M, but instead I made a picture, and that that picture ended up going viral. Oh, what you, you know do? What I'm saying? I did a. Uh, it's a uh, picture, like you know, like in the Lion King when Simba's. I mean, when Mufasa's first telling Simba about like the whole like they're sitting on Pride Rock and he's sh- they're looking out at the horizon and he's like everything that light touches is your kingdom, mm-hmm. and so like it's that spot where it's that shot where you see the backs of both of them, Mufasa sitting next to Simba. Instead of Mufasa being there, it's the boy, and he's next to Simba, and on the back of his hoodie it says "Born King." Mm. And so, like, I I made that like the night after the controversy dropped, and then it ended up getting picked up by uh, Global Grind, and they they picked me along with like four or five of the artists to highlight as like you know uh, uh, reactions, image reactions, or, pan, or artistic reactions to the whole movement, and so just just like just that in itself me doing that picture i reached like hundreds of thousands of eyeballs and i was able to share like how i felt about it without like coming across like ah you know crazy it's like wow this dude took a time to paint a picture about how he felt and it was it it kind of spin the whole situation from a negative to a positive mm, it went from yeah. coolest monkey in the jungle to born king who wouldn't want to be born a king you know what i'm saying so it's like flipping it you know putting my own flip on it but like using my art to do that i'm I'm noticing you're very like keen on like using capturing your emotion and turning it into your painting but also the timing of it yeah it it seems to be very impactful timing is important because people we we live in such a like a clickbait like super like everybody's attention span is like less than a goldfish now because of like there's so much stimulation around us everything like from instagram to facebook to twitter to to tiktok to to what we're gonna eat tonight to what movie kiss came out to the netflix show to i mean i'm saying like so many it's like what's what's next what's next so yeah. you could go, something could happen today and a week from now, there'll be five other, <laughs> 10 other stories that came out that got your brain tripping. Yep. And so time is really the essence when, when you're talking about responding to social issues, because just think about how big like certain stuff was like Ferguson riots and, and things of that nature. And like now, you know, you can't even tell me when that happened. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I, I, yeah you're right, actually. Yeah, I can't do it. So it's like, it's like, you know, people really uh, are prisoner of the moment which isn't a bad thing it's just kind of like how it is you know what i'm saying but as artists <clears throat> it's important because it's 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 not just an opportunity but it's a way to express how you feel in that moment yeah and, it's like and, a journal and, yeah and it's like don't put it off in a way but it's also like and that's just me thinking about art and just art in general like mm-hmm. dealing with timely issues it's mm-hmm. it's smart to commentate on things yeah you have business to. wise and personal because you get your thoughts out and also someone might connect you and also mm-hmm. you might get that recognition you needed because mm-hmm. it was something timely yeah and at the end of the day that's what art is about you know sharing your viewpoint through you know through your art well, whatever, it, it's interesting. whatever that is it's very interesting that that you know we live in a city washington dc that do, the artist you know you me mm-hmm. we we I mean, I actually don't comment on my social issues, but a lot, it's very, it's very prolific and common mm-hmm. for people to comment on social issues with their art in DC. But right. it's so crazy to look at like museums and the Louvre and I don't know, if, I don't know how many museums you've been to, I'm sure you've yeah. been to a lot. There's not much commentation right, on, right. on, on yeah, social they, issues. Yeah, they tend to censor that part a bit. I mean, unless you're going to a, a solo you show. You think so? Do, do you think that like art was, it, like art museum curation is censored or do you think that people just didn't talk about well, it? Well, I think that, when you're talking about the, like the Louvre and the, like a lot of the big yeah, museums, yeah, like, like big art galleries in general, like I feel like I never see much art activism. In, yeah, in that's the collections. Well, you got to realize like that that when once you get to that stage, it's it's just like uh, anything else. Like you have a small amount of people who are controlling that, mm. and so like it's not like uh, you know it's not like a nonprofit or anything like that. Like when it gets to that level, especially when you're dealing with art. You got like a group of like ten people that probably get to decide yeah. what goes in, what goes out, and they've been on that board their whole life, you know, since the museum started. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's not going to change just because a dope piece of art came out, and you know, what I'm saying like it would get a lot of attention. They're going to stick with what they want in their space because it is their space. Yeah, and so uh, yeah, I it's you know it's same thing with tv like all the tv stations are going to like a group an umbrella like three or four different major networks mm-hmm. that have three or four different ceos so it's like that's why we all see the same shit on every channel you know what i'm saying like yeah there's stuff that would enlighten us and make us smarter but they put you know a lot of garbage on yeah because it's like it's part of the plan it's part of the scheme so it's like no one watches it anymore 
Yeah, man. That's why that's why stuff like Netflix and stuff blows up because those are independent things that make stuff independently. They don't have anybody telling them what what they cannot put out. But also and in people matri- gravitate towards. But that. also in major galleries, there really isn't much uh, present like representation of uh, the minority people. Like right, yeah. Not, I mean, it's uh, a white male dominated yeah, industry. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's white male dominated industry. So like, there's not much of it. But there has been a lot of initiatives recently. Have you noticed that as well? Like there's a lot of a well, lot more you know initiatives? what? I, there's something I started following. Uh, he's like. He's uh, one of the the biggest uh, art critics in New York. Oh, wow. Well, His name's Jerry Saltz. Okay. Jerry Saltz. And I'm going to follow him. I've been, I've been following him, but I've, more importantly, I've been listening to a lot of his talks because I'm kind of like, I need to get inside the heads of these people who are buying these pieces or how does this whole world work? Yeah. You know, there's this whole underworld of like art buying and collecting that like a lot of people don't even know about. It seems, it seems like another world. It is. Like it's you, definitely another world. Like you say world, world but, but to, as an artist, it seems like a whole other galaxy. Like it seems so out of our reach. Yeah. It's like, it's a very who's who and, you know, like very, uh clickish yeah you know what i'm saying and so i'm like i need to know what these people are how they talk and all that stuff so i started listening to jerry sauce and one of the things that he said is he's actually an advocate for more minority representation in the Mm -hmm. arts and they actually have a rule because the industry is so white male dominated Mm -hmm. they have a rule and i think it actually it's been it's been a rule but it, it only it only happens uh like once every four or five years to where the exhibits have to show a uh, person of color as their uh, artist oh and they can't show anybody that's a white man a white male and i was i was i found that intriguing because i didn't even know about that like there's like i, I have to actually go back and, and look like at, like throughout the rotation of, of exhibitions yeah. that come through at some interval they have to have someone of color they have to have someone of color and and also they have to not have any person that is considered the majority which is white male and so there's this there's like this and it's like it's more than just like a you know a few months it's like a few years Mm -hmm. to where that there's this there's this the window that they that reopens every so often to where they show only people of color or is that like galleries everywhere or just like a certain gallery or the prominent galleries okay so like the ones we have around here yeah the ones that you know the ones that are are you know it's just like Mm -hmm. uh, uh, colleges get accredited accredited it's yeah. the same thing where galleries, you know, you can have a gallery anywhere, but these are the galleries that actually have some pull or mm. like these are the ones that are represented by the top artists yeah. in that field. And so they have to they have to make space for the for the minority, mm-hmm. which I thought was cool and also interesting. I actually had to go back and look and see more details. But I remember I remember seeing that and I thought that was I thought that was dope because I had never heard about that. You know, I was, you know, like, I guess you just got to get in where you fit in, you know, but they actually they make space for those people. Yeah, so. I think it's I think it's an amazing thing. Mm. Uh, I mean, I went to a talk at the Portrait Gallery a couple months ago, and that was I, essentially the subject was yeah. was diversity in the representation of, yeah. of who's in the gallery, and, right. and it it honestly never dawned on me. Like, yeah. I, for some reason, I just never thought about that. Yeah, and and, and then I was like, oh shit, I was like, yeah, because you don't you just see the work, you never see the artist. You exactly. Know? Like, there's never I never been to a, a museum and the artist was there. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, half of them are dead. Yeah. <laughs> you know I, what I mean? think if you saw like their fo- their portraits and you'd be like, oh wow, these are all just middle aged white dudes. Right. Like, like what is going yeah, on here? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's that's definitely one thing, I, and that's one of my goals too. I want to get like in the portrait gallery. I want to get in the Smithsonian. Yeah, I know. And, yeah, I know. You, and, you, and you've been saying like that. you yeah. want to be recognized as one of the greats. How do you yeah. intend to do that? Yeah, uh, just you know, just constantly being, just being consistent. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's the best way I can go about that because I know one thing: if I stop, I won't get there. But I know right. if I keep going. Uh, something will happen along the way that'll put me in that in that space in that environment, and I, once I get there, I'll make sure I take advantage of the opportunity. But I don't know when or how it will happen, but I just know I gotta be, be prepared for it. And the only way you can do that is by just being on point and just staying sharp and staying like staying out in the eye, like you said, getting your pieces out in public. Have you learned anything like from that guy or anything of how to even get in those circles, like how to even get into that world? Yeah, and he pretty much said the same thing. It's funny because, so he's like one of the most renowned art critics now, but yeah. he spent, uh, well, he, he he grew up wanting to be a painter. Mm-hmm. He went to college to be a painter and ended up, uh, he, he calls it summoning, he calls it finally giving in to the demons at night that tell you that you're going to be a failure. Damn. And so he said, well, as an artist, we all have the demons that come and speak to us. And tell us we're not good enough or we need we're shit or, yeah. you know, 
we'll never make it. And he finally listened to him. Damn. And so he became a truck driver. Whoa. And he was a truck driver for like 20 years. And then finally he got to the point where he said, well, you know what? I'm not going to go back to being an artist, but I want to be in that world. So I'm going to critique the art. So I got to be a writer. And he said the first piece that he ever wrote that was successful was when he stopped trying to sound smart and he just wrote. Mm. And so that turned into him, you know, being being one of the biggest art critics in New York. And now that's, well, that's he, a real thing because a yeah. lot of people in the art world can get real ver- verbose and just start yeah. saying words and putting things together. Just like, and you get lost. You're like, just like, shut up. It like, sounds like a Shakespeare poem. Like, 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 <laughs> even artists. Like how yeah. many artists like intros or like explanations of their exhibition have you read? And you're just like, oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah just exactly. Like, just, like, like, just say what you mean. Dude. Yeah. Like you don't need all these yeah. 16 syllable words. Up right. There. Like, right. Yeah, so he said when he finally stopped trying to sound smart, that's when he became successful as an art critic, and now he's doing what he what his life's calling is. It took him thirty years to figure it out, but he, hey, he's doing it now. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. He's at the top of his field, and so uh, that was that was another thing I, I kind of took from him. Even though I might not agree with everything he says, like there's mm-hmm. certain things that you have to listen to that he, you know, is true. You know what I mean? I so, mean, there's something there's something people like him know that yeah. he just. Right, I, I guess that's. And what he it basically is. said too, like as an artist, you just gotta, you gotta stay consistent, and you gotta stop being scared to to walk up. He said, if you see me on public, you just you know come up to me and say what's up, or like ask me a question. Like, don't be scared to like ask people how to do what you're trying to do. Because mm. a lot of times we we think we are too vulnerable, or might make ourselves look dumb or stupid if we go ask somebody like how to do something, you know, but. A lot of times that that kind of that ask can turn into a whole conversation, which can turn into relationship, which can turn into money. <laughs> no, I think you're you know understanding. Right? I mean, like, there's even myself. I can think of you saying that. I can think of photographers who are doing the work that I wish I was doing. And, yeah. and like now, like I'm like, oh, you know, maybe I will shoot them that DM. Be like, hey, how'd you get that gig? Yeah. Or how'd you do that? Or someone looking at you being like, yo, how'd you get Bruh, that mural? Some of the some of the craziest best things that I've ever been a part of when I just showed up and I just made up in my mind I was going to be there like I didn't have ticket the the day that I met Nipsey Hussle mm-hmm. I didn't have tickets to that to the Broccoli Fest I wasn't Whoa. supposed to be there like and I brought artwork with me but I just <laughs> we went man we went early super early me and a group of other people we uh yeah. devoted you know film crew and we got turned away at the door Damn. when we first because we didn't have credentials. We were mm-hmm. we were like saying we were the media there and stuff like that. You're they trying everything. Turned us away. So we're sitting in the van at like 7:30 a.m. After we had tried to get in, we got mm-hmm. up there super early, like right when they were setting up. Wow. And everybody's like, "Man, fuck, we're just going to go home." I'm like, nah, somebody Google Kinkos. Somebody Google Kinkos right now. So we Google Kinkos. I'm like, the joint was like two miles away. I'm like, we're going there. So we get to Kinkos. I go on Google. I get the broccoli logo, I get the uh, I get the Devota logo, like our because we all had the gear on everything, yeah. cameras, all that. Get the Devota logo, put media pass, put the joints on what? tags, get the little plastic name tags from the front, what? put them in there. We had like four or five of them printed off, like parking, uh, like press parking stickers. No way uh, to put in the window of the van. Drove back. Walked right in. No. Next thing you what? know, I'm backstage. What? Yeah, watching uh watching uh Miguel do a sound check. Like, that is crazy. On my, on my mom, bro. Like that shit was bro, crazy. That yeah. is some next Literally level. like saying, like, nah, I'm gonna be here. Like I'm supposed to be here. And yeah. that whole day, you know what I'm saying? Like, I you know, Miguel, uh Rich the Kid, Light Show, Nipsey Hustle, Cardi B, Migos. Damn. All there that day. You know what Damn. I'm saying? So it's like Shit was crazy. Dog. I can't like, believe you finessed the passes like that and no yeah, one said anything. Yeah, bro. And it was because we was there early and they'd already seen us before, but we had kind of played dumb. Like, uh, well, they said they're going to have our credentials uh, back there. Like, how are we supposed to get them? So, we like, you left in. and you got them again. You So, when they came back, it's kind of like, like they seen right. us, but then, and then when they seen we had our stuff, they just kind of didn't even look. They just waved us like, in. Right. And then we were still there early because the festival didn't start till noon. We got back at like 9 a.m. That's crazy. And so we're in there just walking around like it's just us and the, uh, the people that work there. And they're kind of like, they're looking at us, but they, we're in there now. You know what I'm saying? And then like I was there so early, I walked straight to backstage because they didn't have, they didn't even have anybody up there checking backstage. Yeah, because it was so early. It's too early. So I'm by the time it started, they had already seen me back there. So now it's more face card than yeah, anything. Yeah, they're just like, all right, yeah, come on. Like, bro yeah. was here. Bro was here when they were setting up. Like, he's supposed to be here. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, y'all better leave my man alone. And then I got paintings with me, so it looked even more official. Yeah. So I was literally walking in and out. 
Like every time the next artist would come up, I would, I would get that artist painting, go back to my. Wait, little, so you already had the paintings for the brought, lineup? Yeah, I brought all the. I did all the paintings the night before. Whoa! I painted. I did five in one night. You did thirty-five paintings, and, and I, I did five paintings. Oh, in one five night. paintings. Yeah, yeah, that's still a lot. Yeah, yeah. I had only thing I had done already was a sketch and outline, so I just had to paint. But still, like that was another day where I was this close to falling asleep, and something made me stay up. And that whole next day was just like crazy, Damn. crazy. Like I was just like, by the time I got home that night, I was done. <laughs> I don't think I, I think I slept till like four p.m. the next day. But moments, but moments like that, like like when things actually work, when you mm-hmm. get turned away, when you go to the Kinkos, mm-hmm. like when you're when you drive your car up to that fence yeah. and, and they let you buy like the, the, the feeling that yeah. you get in that moment like i've had that feeling it's yeah. you're just like the universe wants this to happen yeah. like, like, like you just feel I'm like supposed to be like, here. Like, you're like the universe wants me to be here doing this right yeah because they told me no i could easily like everybody was ready to go home yeah. like everybody except my boy trey like me and him always kind of like are on the same page mm-hmm. so he's sitting there thinking and i'm like seeing his brain work but everybody else is done like they're like all right, I guess I'm about to go to my girl house, and you know what I'm saying? I'm like, nah, bro, we going to Kinko's. <laughs> we going to Kinko's. <laughs> I need a computer and Photoshop right now. <laughs> that's some real dedication yeah. shit. Like, that's, that's the stuff that, like, people need to hear. It's like, no, yeah. like, you actually tried. You tried to copy the shit and work. Like, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, bro. We was in there, man, the whole day. And it was so funny because one of the people that was with us, I'm going to tell you this for a laugh. One of the people that was with us, you know, he had got in with us. Yeah. So we get in there, we're cooling, the festival starts, and then all of a sudden, my boy Trey comes up to me. He's like, yo, uh, he's like, did you talk to Black? Because that's who we was with. And he was like, he was like, nah, I was like, nah, I ain't talked to him. He was like, man, he just called me saying he's outside, he's stuck outside. And I'm like, well, how did he get outside? He left? Yeah. And he's like, he's like, man, I don't know. So then I try to call him and uh He's like, he's like, yo, bro, you see you can come get me from, from outside. I'm like, bro, why did you leave? He was like, well, you know, since we got the tags and everything, I was going I was gonna bring a couple people in with me. I'm like, bro, those aren't real. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh my god. You was with us when we made them. <laughs> oh, what happened? I was like, dude, was the finesse that that good that we we finessed ourselves? Yeah, he, like, he, he believed his own lie. God damn. That but hilarious. that's how real it was. It was like, bro, we're in here. Bro believed it so much. He left and came back trying to get in with the same pass we made. And now they're open. Now they're like, bro, that man our that man our passes. You know what I'm saying? Like, y'all, y'all made those. He almost we, got we you all got them up. on. Got we got the tied. t-shirts on. I'm like, oh bro, you just made God. the whole situation hot, hot, hot. Yeah. Like. I'm like, nah, I ain't coming to get you, bro. Yeah, like, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, man. You, bro, you just like, ain't coming in. Yeah, because if I go out there, they're going to be like, oh, he with you? He in here? Like, where your ticket at? Like, nah, hey, bro. His dumb ass tried to get some girls in back. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what he tried exactly. to do. He tried to get some girls in. Right, he got show you caught like, up for the book. That's how good the finesse was. He finessed himself. And he was there <laughs> when we printed him. <laughs> bro, you was at Kinko's with us. It's like, don't try to come back in, man. Right. Like, you left? Why? All you had to do was stay. All you had to do was stay. That's hilarious. Yeah, free reign over this whole. You know what I'm saying? We was out. We was outside the. Uh, so were, uh, were most artists like? How did they react to them to you giving them paintings? I feel like I, I feel like I've heard of people doing that before. So like, how do how do they react to that? Yeah, uh, it's always different. Sometimes it's super like appreciative, super humble. I, I'm trying to think of one time where it was kind of like, uh, you're like, oh fuck that guy. You can drop any names if you want to. Well, no, no, nah, nah, I I didn't feel like I didn't feel like fuck that guy. I was just like. Uh, again, I don't know if he really liked it or not. You know what I'm saying? Mm. But uh, man, every time, like especially when I gave the nip, he was super appreciative. Like sat there and chopped it up with me, you know, for like a good three, four minutes. Um, yeah, I done stuff with Deion Sanders. Ray Lewis was super like Ray Lewis gave me a hug. Man, I felt like that I was that man's nephew or something Damn. when he hugged me. Like Ray Lewis is a good dude. Deion's real. What's the idea behind giving some like a famous person a portrait of themselves? Um, so sometimes it's kind of set up that way. Like when I did the Ray Lewis thing, it was, uh, mm-hmm. it was during the Super Bowl. He had a Ray of Hope, uh, which is his foundation. They had an event at the Porsche headquarters in Atlanta and I was, uh, asked to do a live painting. They paid for the, they did, they paid for the materials and everything. It was through one of his assistants. Oh, okay. So, so it was more different. of a surprise. And so it was kind of like, Hey, do you want to come paint at the Porsche headquarters? You'll be on the Hall of Fame floor with all the NFL Hall of Famers, and you get to meet Ray Lewis and this, that. And I'm oh, like, hell an, yeah, that's shit. an easy yes. And I'm like, even if I don't like, even if I don't make any money, like you said, the relationship I can make 
in the Hall of Fame room with a yeah. bunch of NFL players. There you go. Is more than I would get if somebody paid me to do something. I'm in the, you know I'm in the middle of a bar, or bistro, or something. You know, what it's what I'm like, like last time I checked, you got a room for people who can actually afford your pieces exactly, on the wall. Exactly, exactly. So I hopped on that opportunity, and it worked out perfect because the day before I was. Uh, with Dion on a on a paid gig, mm-hmm. I he that was when his thirty for thirty dropped. Dion Sanders, yeah, okay. that was when his thirty for thirty dropped about him playing uh, baseball and football at the same time. Yeah, that's wild. And so I got to do the imagery uh, for his t shirts because he was dropping thirty for thirty t shirts and signed limited edition prints on his site, and I made the design for that. So it's basically him in a brave uniform looking in the mirror and the Atlanta Falcons him is, is staring back. How the hell did you get that gig? It seems like such a crazy gig. Uh, to get it crazy uh so i did work with southwest airlines a few years ago and my plug there um just recently started doing his own thing and dion was one of his clients mm-hmm. he was helping him with social media uh strate- strategizing him and his son because his son runs a lot of his stuff on his website and everything like that the junior and so he was working with them he said hey I got this artist that I think would come up with some good, uh, you know, illustrations for you guys trying to push what you're trying to do for 30 for 30. You want them. So they said yes. So they Perfect. Were, yeah. So he brought me in. It's like crazy how that works out, right? I'll see you in Atlanta. <laughs> and crazy that was relationships. One of the, that was one of the best uh, <sighs> best weekends of my life, man. I'm literally going from show to show. We went from the, the Stephen A. Smith show to the Rich Eisman show to to ESPN with the Daniel Thomason and the uh, – uh, Emma Smith, like wow. it was crazy. Like I literally followed him on his whole press run that whole day. So like wherever he goes, I was going. And the golf carts, they was, yeah, the golf carts ready for us. Like taking us backstage, went to Waffle House with him. Whoa! Like I, I rode in the Uber with Dion, his driver, and my guy to Waffle House because we just got split up in the in the trucks. And so I ended up getting in Dion's truck. And so I'm sitting right behind him, and we're driving to Waffle House. And I'm like. This is crazy. I was just in D.C. yesterday. Now I'm going to fucking Waffle House yeah, with Deion Sanders. Like, crazy. prime time. Yeah. Like, what? We get out the car. Everybody like, yo, prime. Yo, prime. Like, soon as, like they could see him through the tents. You know what I'm saying? Like, he just got an aura in Atlanta. Like, it's nobody gotta else. It's got to be crazy being in situations like that. Because, like, you're five years in the game. Like, what do you think your past self would have said to you or future self if you were like, yo, you're going to be in a car with Deion Sanders falling would and never, doing his pain? I would have like, never believed it, bro. Isn't that some crazy shit? I would have never believed it, bro. Like... Especially like when I first started, it was like I couldn't even think of no shit like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you can't you can't dream of stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. But the dope part about like how everything comes full circle is funny because the one thing that did like reinforce like, damn, this is like exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. The whole thing I did for Dion was for the thirty for thirty. When I first started when I first very first made a decision I was gonna start painting, mm-hmm. I love ESPN, so I called my project 30 for 30, and it was 30 paintings in 30 days. I felt like if I was going to start, if I was going to do something, I had to prove to myself that I was serious about it. So I was going to do a new piece of work every day. Even if I didn't finish it, I had to start a new one the next day and have them all done by the end of the 30 days. And that that instilled within within me a great work, work ethic. And then also just uh, started to build that consistency I've been talking about, about doing something like, because at the time I was working too. That's got to be crazy. So I work a double. A every, I work a double, 10 to 10, get home by like 11, and then stay up to like 5, 6, and wake back up at 9 to get ready to go back to work at 10. You know wow. what I'm saying? Like that joint right there, that's when I was like, I had to prove it to myself because if yeah. I don't believe in myself, then nobody else is. Yeah. So once I had to make that, I had to make that whole project for me to get started. Because if I felt like I felt like if I was gonna say, "All right, I'm gonna be a painter. I'm gonna start," I'd have did like one painting in that month, versus doing thirty paintings, whether they were shit or not. Like, that Why, was, why'd you have to prove it to yourself? Like, why? What was that about? Like, were you, were you like not painting before? Like, what what was the experience yeah? I, there? My background was graphic design. I had always been like really good at drawing, mm-hmm. and I could paint. You know, I knew I could paint because I took painting courses. But like I said, like you know, when you're working, it's easy to get caught up in that. You know, you got to make sure you're at work on time or so you get fired and you got to make sure you perform well so you don't make any money because it's tip based. And so I can't I can't be to work and be in a shitty mood or none of that. Like I always had to be friendly and kind of, you know, be able to talk to people and connect with people. And so I felt like if I didn't make something like a drastic change, like I would be stuck because, I, you know, I was somewhat comfortable. How did you know you wanted to paint? Like what was it? Was um, there it was like a, a moment or something? Well, no. Nah, uh, I think for me, painting is like the most like divine form of art because like when we go in museums, what do we see? We see paintings. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When you look through history books, what do you see? You see paintings. You never see like sketches or like 
I mean, we're in a digital world now, but there's something timeless about a painting. There is. Because we know that was done by hand versus on the computer. We know, like, whoever did that, they put, you know, they sat in front of that canvas and it was just them moving their hand back and mm -hmm. forth to make that image happen. And there's something, like, classic and magical about that. And then so it's like, when I, when I thought about paintings, I'm like, I want to leave behind a, a great legacy. And so what better legacy to have than, like, all these pieces of art that are hung up all around the world versus, like, you know, a, a drawing that could get torn or something like that. When people get a painting, they preserve it. No, I feel you know that what even I mean? as a photographer, I look at paintings like, fuck, that's, it's like, it's appreciated more. Like, yeah. something about a painting that people just respect more. Yeah, yeah, that respect, yeah. And so that, I think that's, that's what I was looking for. Because at the end of the day, I want to be considered one of the greats. What do you have to do to be considered one of the greats? You have to have a collection of great work. And what does that work consist of? Mostly paintings. You know what I'm saying? Oh, for I mean, artists. Yeah. And you know, the thing is, like, we live in a crazy age now, so that could change. But you look back for hundreds, thousands of years, it's all paintings, right? So it's yeah. like, it makes sense. It's like, but to be great, man, like, to be really great, to be considered a great, you have to be almost mad. Like, you have to yeah, have an insane, insane workout yeah. that, that makes a normal person yeah. sit there with their head scratched. Like, when you look at Basquiat, when you look at mm -hmm. people like that, they would they, they could go out and party and stuff, but they would get home and they would work their face paint, off. Yeah. And you would sit there bewildered by the their output. Yeah. You know, so it's like you have to have a, almost a maniacal output or, For or, sure. or production of these paintings For to sure. even raise your level. Because by doing all that, it's like the reps at the gym. By doing all those reps, mm -hmm. you become great. It's yeah. like you, you, you earn it in a way, in a yeah. weird way. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, that's very true. And that's one thing I actually take pride in. I take pride in being able to go out and get fucked up and then come home and and and, and create like i i enjoy um, painting like lit you know what i'm no saying way. like <laughs> yeah <laughs> like sometimes i'll be sitting at home and i'll be painting and i'm just like you know what we need to make this more fun <laughs> 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 let me go get some loud <laughs> and a little pint and like, let's see what happens you know what i'm saying <laughs> and like it's funny like i know i know i know it's not good like to drink and, and all that stuff like it's not good for your body but for me it's like, man, I stay up. I, I be, I be like, all right, I got half a bottle of wine left, so I can paint for an hour, then I can take a glass of that, and then I can go smoke, and then after that, I can paint some more. You're and so, versus just being like, all right, I'm gonna sit here and paint until I'm tired. Yeah. Like it makes it more fun. It's it like does. I, I reached the mile, I reached the next milestone of having my glass refilled because <laughs> I worked an hour straight. Like, and it's like I end up staying up the whole night, no problem. Versus if I would have sat there with nothing and just been like painting. I'll fall asleep right in the chair. Yeah, that seems fucking boring. You, know what I'm saying? Man. you gotta yeah. do something like get your mind out. Right? Yeah, play some music, get some music going. Like it's just fun. And then like sometimes like especially when I do my backgrounds, I like to get very abstract and very crazy. Mm -hmm. Like the portraits, you know, a little bit more confined. You know, very careful of where I'm, what I'm doing. The eyes have to be correct and stuff like that. Else, it doesn't look like that person. But when you get to the background, it's like man, you can get crazy with it. Yeah. And I like doing stuff like that. I like putting the brush down and maybe smearing it with my hands or like Ooh. laying on the ground and, and doing some Jackson Pollock and drip the, drip the background on, you know? Mm. So it's just like, there's certain, I, don't, I just like, I just like being lit while I paint. Like it nah, just I, makes it fun. Everyone has a different process. Yeah. Right? I think in a lot of ways you, ha it, it, you can and should have to go out of your mind a little bit yeah. and like express and, and do some drugs a little bit. I mean, I right. know, I know like, <laughs> I mean, I, I know when my best ideas have come from being super baked yeah. and, being, and being like, you know, it'd be tight. Yeah. And it's like sitting there and, and I like to write my ideas down. So right. I'm journaling. I'm like, oh, I'm like, what if I did this or this? Yeah. My last exhibition came from this one idea where I was like, wouldn't it be so crazy if this kid was like, and this is like, this is my internal monologue uh -huh. after someone else. Right, right, right. I was like, wouldn't it be so crazy if like someone was in a classroom and they like, they shot themselves in the head, but instead of them like killing themselves, like the other side was like a beautiful explosion and it didn't represent death. It was like something a little deeper. Whoa. And so just off that one idea, I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> How could I do that? And See? so, and so I took that idea to my buddy Trent, who's a graphic designer, super talented, does colorful stuff. I was like, Hey, uh -huh. I was like, I have this idea. I want the, I want you to illustrate the explosion. Mm -hmm. That idea turned us, turned into us going into Goochland, Virginia, into mm -hmm. this abandoned school, mm -hmm. dressing him up as a school kid, and we painted some airsoft guns where he and he posed for the photo. Oh and, shit. And, and then we did this entire series of works yeah. 
you know, and, and we also painted, he also painted some like airsoft AR-15s and stuff. We did these series of works around the entire like abandoned school. Yeah. And that turned into our, our exhibition we had in December. That was wow. just like insanely successful. But it was all off that one idea being baked in my room. Dog, you got to keep me in the loop about this shit. Bro. I know. I, I feel bad. Yeah. I wish I would have invited Dog, you, man. that would have been dope, bro. Dude, it was an inc- insane. But yeah, you see how that shit happened though? Yeah. Just like literally just like one thing. Just And then it just, it blossoms. Like it's like a seed, man. You water it, watch this shit grow. I know. You know what I'm saying? It's no. like our job is to bring ideas to life, you know? Like, like as, as artists, it's like our idea, our job is to bring the intangible to tangible. Facts, facts. That's that's what we're here for, and then that's what all I want to do, man, just keep sharing my work with everybody and then just seeing how people react to it. Hell yeah, man. You know what I'm saying? And giving them something to talk about. Like, there's nothing better than, you know, uh, driving conversation, especially good conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, we get... We get caught up in the course of life, you know, arguments and, and, and banter back and forth. It's dope to have a dope conversation about, like, something that really, at the end of the day, you might not even care about. Mm-hmm. But still, it's there, and it's there, and it makes you talk about it. So, like, just trying to keep putting out them, them pieces for everybody to talk about. Fuck yeah, man. Well, dude, I feel like this is, like, a natural kind of closing in a weird way. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, man. It's been fucking awesome talking to you, Bashan, uh, dude. Like, as always, man. Likewise, bro. Like, yeah, you're, you're real, cool, man. dude. I can't wait to see what you got coming. Is there anything coming up that you want to let people yeah, know Yeah, the about? auto show is coming up. Uh, What's the auto show? The auto show happens every year. This year is happening uh, January 24th through February 2nd at the Convention Center. Um, tickets are on their website, WashingtonAutoShow.com. Mm-hmm. And I'll be up there every day. I'm painting the Toyota Super, which I'm super hype about what like, you're painting a super that wait the new supra the new supra oh my god they show me like every year i get a different a different vehicle like last year i got uh, a highlander but the first year i did it had a minivan which i was like i was stoked to be there but i was like fuck i'm painting a minivan, like a fucking minivan. then the next year i painted the, the new stinger which was like a dope kia and it was just like now nah, this is what i was wanted this is what i want to paint and that that one came out crazy last year i did the highlander which was still dope but it was like, uh, it's not like a, a coupe or like a, yeah. a race car. You want something cool. Again. Man, they sent me the Supra. I almost dropped my phone. I'm like, I'm paying that? Like, Damn. what? I'm going to be up there early. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, 24th through February 2nd, I'll be up there every day, 9 to 9. And uh, anybody who wants to come out, they got a tickets on their side. I think kids are like 4 bucks, 5 bucks, and adults are 12 Nice. And they can so, probably yeah. check you out the Instagram to find all that stuff out. Yeah, I'll put the link in my bio. and um, It's like what? It's at SP the plug? At SP the plug. And um, I'll be on the third floor where all the exotic and the foreign cars are at. So it's also like a good floor just to be on. We'll have our parts called uh, Art of Motion. So it'd be me and a few other artists on e- each of our vehicles. And the rest of the floor will be all exotics like the Bentleys, Rari's, and all that stuff. Awesome. So what are the dates again? Uh, the 24th. So not this Friday, but January. next Friday. Yeah. Not this Friday, but next Friday. It opens Friday the 24th, and it goes till February 2nd, which I believe is Super Bowl Sunday. Nice. Yeah. Sweet, man. Dude, I, I can't wait to see those stories and maybe check it out. That sounds <laughs> fucking great, crazy. Man. Just come up there, man. I'll bring you in through the back door. Hey, <laughs> I'm going to print out some fake-ass media passes. <laughs> <here>. <laughs> no need. I got you. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you so much for being on. Uh, thank you, man. All right, guys. That's it. That's the angle. Peace out. Peace. Sweet. No, bro. Yeah, that was an awesome. Duh. That was a cool chat, dude. Duh, man. I'm glad you had me, bro. That was sweet.